slides and educate. I'll just uh, introduce myself. I'm Amy Reischauer. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of the SEC's Office of the Advocate for Small Business Capital Formation, like the longest title in the agency. Um, I'll talk more about what that title means. Um, but um, And before I introduce or I let John introduce himself, I will say that um, the views that John and I express today are our own in our um, capacities as staff of our respective offices, and they don't necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners, or our colleagues on the staff. So I will take care of that boring bit for me and John, and then I'll let John introduce himself briefly now. I'd like to associate myself with your those remarks and your energy, Amy. Um, so uh, great to, to be here with, with Rochelle and the Lightship Group. Um, so uh, I've followed Candace's work over time, so it's great to, to have a little bit of a reminder about that as well. Um, I'm John Moses. I am the deputy director in another long uh, office named uh, group in SEC, the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy. And um, I think we'll, we'll talk uh, just a little bit about our office's work focusing on building wealth for yourself and your family a little bit distinct, but complementary to the work that you're doing to build uh, build up your business, which is the bulk of the program with Amy. Um, my office is focused on developing um, content and, and uh, presentations like this through investor.gov and through our contact center, uh, which we'll talk about as well. So great to be here with you, Amy. Awesome. Um, so uh, to get us started, um, why are we here? What do we hope to offer you this evening? Um, so I you know I, I kicked off with a disclaimer and then kind of announced that, you know, we're from the SEC, we're here to help. That's probably not the most compelling, compelling start off to one of these uh, virtual workflow Wednesdays. Um, but uh, we do mean it. And, um, you know, we hope to leave you today with a sense of kind of who we are and what we do for entrepreneurs and their investors and the kinds of resources that our offices offer. Um, we also welcome your questions, your comments, your feedback. Um, and so we'll save some time at the end to answer what we can and to hear from you. Uh, I think you can drop those in the chat or the Q&A function and we'll do our best to keep those tracked down. Um, before I get too much further, I'm gonna try and share my screen here. And this worked a minute ago, so let's hope it works for the real thing. All right, hopefully y'all can see my screen, uh, or John will holler at me if you can't. Um, so here we are. Um, as the evening goes, I will start by telling you a little bit about the SEC. Um, and then I'll pass the mic back to John to tell us a little bit more about his office and all the great tools they have for investors. Um, then I'll give some background on my office with the long with the long name and kind of what our role is. Next, we'll walk through what it means to raise capital from investors and how companies go about doing that. Um, I'll get a little spoiler alert. There are a number of potential pathways and the rules can be pretty complicated and confusing. Um, but the good news is that as soon as I scare you with all that complexity, I will let you off the hook because this should not, does not need to be and should not be a closed book exam. Um, like John's office, we have lots of resources for you, so I will share some of those. Um, so that gives you a little roadmap of the conversation. Um, again, like I said, feel free to drop in questions as we go. Um, so getting started, what is the SEC and maybe more importantly, why should you care? Um, the agency has a three-part mission, and that is to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. So, you, you know, you tend to hear about the SEC as like going after the Wall Street bad guys and investigating, you know, financial fraud, that kind of thing. Um, and that's certainly true. That reflects a large part of what the, what the agency does. Um, but it does more than just enforce the laws. Uh, you know, we really want to make sure that folks understand the rules and how to comply with them, because um, I think that's really essential to fulfilling that three part mission, whether we're talking about investor protection or capital formation or, you know, or, or some other aspect of it. Um, so, again, can't speak for John or his office, but I'd like to think that both of our offices seek to educate folks. Um, you know, throughout the marketplace before we get to the kinds of scenarios where our enforcement colleagues would step in. Um, another, another way I like to think about that is, um, you know, 
We want to empower individuals like yourselves and folks in your network um, to be informed savers, right? That's really what investment tends to be. Um, you're, you know, you're investing in your own life, your own livelihood, whether that's like retirement or college savings or um, or maybe that's entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, so, you know, as lots of you know, small businesses require funds to launch and those early funds always start like almost always, maybe always start with you know, personal savings of the founders. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurs start by saving, then they invest in themselves and then in their business. And then maybe they invest proceeds in other small businesses. So our offices together and our rules really seek to try and protect and facilitate that story at, at each of those chapters. Um, so that's how I tend to picture it anyway. That's kind of the story arc I think of. Um, and I think it makes for a pretty good segue to John and the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy to talk about kind of building and protecting those savings. Thank you, Amy. So the bulk of the conversation today is going to be um, discussing um, capital formation, raising capital for your business. But I want to make sure uh, that you are thinking about your personal financial situation, not just the financial situation of, of your business. And as Amy said, sometimes there's a continuum. There needs to be often some kind of capital, even if it'll just to allow you the space in your life to, to focus on, on launching your business. Um, so thinking about your personal financial situation, what we're talking about in our Office of Investor Education and Advocacy is information that we can give you that helps you think about making a financial plan, Certainly your business is part of that, um, but thinking about all the rest of your financial choices, especially because you can get, and, and I think a lot of folks in the ecosystem will probably encourage you to be really focused on your business, thinking about, which is great, but also thinking about how are you managing your, your debt um, and how are you taking part of taking care of this sort of three-part process of paying down high interest debt, saving, and investing for your future. You can go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, we encourage you to, um, before you start investing, um, to educate yourself. So some of the people that are watching this um, later, I know in the, the uh, Lightship Foundation ecosystem, as you refer to this, this resource, you may have a, a background in finance, you might be an experienced um, and, and savvy investor, but it's a great idea, even if that's you, but especially if it's not, um, to uh, go to some trusted resources. So we like to think that investor.gov can be that trusted resource to go to uh, before you start investing or to check on um, your, uh, your, your plan and make sure it makes sense for you. Importantly, we want you to avoid financial fraud. We want you to research your investments and research uh, investment professionals. Um, so that's all can be done on investor.gov. There it is. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple quick things. So um, if you're looking, if you want to check out your investment professional right there on the main page, you can look into anyone that's trying to sell you uh, a, a, any product or to serve as an investment advisor for you. Or maybe this doesn't apply to you specifically if you, you feel really comfortable with where you are and you have a family member or uh, someone in your network a friend or family member, someone in your network, maybe somebody in the Lightship network that is um, maybe not going down a, a wise path, make sure that you check out that professional. Much of the fraud comes from people that are not registered or um, you, you certainly, if they have negative information in their profile, you want to be aware of it. So it's an easy place to go, investor.gov, to, to check out anyone involved in advising you. Next. Um, we'll also have there some key terms. We'll have information on topics that you care about, whether that's sort of core um, core investing topics like compound growth, asset allocation, and diversification. If you want a, a primer or a refresher on types of in, uh, investment accounts and tax considerations, including maybe especially for those of you that are launching a business, how to think about retirement accounts, especially if you maybe don't have a 401k, if you're launching a, a, a new venture, how do you think about an IRA and, and how can that be important? So all of that is, is covered there. We also have calculators to help you think about what the future looks like. Many of you who are, are, are pitching will, will be very uh, familiar with how these go, but this can be a calculator to think about how does your personal wealth grow at different rates of return and different contributions. Also, we'll want to think about things like college saving 
as well. Next. I mentioned avoiding, uh, avoiding, avoiding fraud, and there's some key red flags. So uh, especially when you're thinking about investments that are for your, your long-term wealth for you and your family, remember if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Be careful about things like wire transfers, uh, crypto, or gift cards. Certainly don't be pressured to buy quickly if it's an exploding offer. Um, that may or may not make sense for your, your, your pitching life, but it is generally a red flag for uh, your, your investments that you have outside. And we want you to be careful about uh, influencers and paid endorsements as well. Next. Uh, we've talked about researching uh, investment professionals. You might be familiar with Edgar. So the database that you can research uh, any public company uh, is, is Edgar. So sec.gov slash Edgar can give you more information about the financials of any public company. And again, you want to take time to do your research before committing your funds. And uh, think about uh, this other form. So in the last few years, there's for form CRS has come out that can help you understand how an investment firm and the professional that you are dealing with or the person in your network that they're dealing with, what services can they offer you? And importantly, what are you paying for? So make sure that you feel comfortable with the, um, you know, the services you're getting and the fees that you're paying. So uh, again, all of that can be found uh, on investor.gov, more information about how to navigate those forms and uh, the types of questions you might wanna understand before moving forward. And uh, just a quick uh, note on some of the bulletins that we have. We have a lot of alerts and bulletins on things like crypto assets, um, self-directed IRAs, and uh, high yield investment program scams. These are constantly being updated. And this is World Investor Week Extended, which start, which is really uh, just the beginning of the month. But we have some great bulletins there to help you think through things like um, sustainable investments, being a resilient investor, and how to think about uh, risks in terms of uh, crypto and, and related uh, investments or assets. And I just want to end with a couple of ways to reach us. You guys will be seeing this, um, you know, separately, as I know many of you are, are in Detroit now. I'll just highlight that we do events like, like this. You can connect with us at outreach at sec.gov, and you can contact right. our help desk at help at sec.gov. Also, our social is there. But the bulk of this will be through, um, sorry, Amy, <laughs> the bulk of this will be through. Um, it seems to want uh, to continue. I'm sorry. Let me see if I can the, pause this. There no, not at all. The bulk of the conversation will be really about Amy and uh, her team and the information they can provide to you um, around raising capital for your business. Uh, but remember, for your personal for your personal investments, investor.gov. Amy? Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure why my uh, deck wants to advance on its own, um, but I will try and uh, try and keep up with it. Um, so turning back to my office, the um, the office of the I'll call it the small business advocacy team. Um, our uh, we were formed about for well we we stood up about four years ago uh, originally established by Congress in 2016. So we're a relatively new office at the at the commission. Um, we tend to fancy ourselves as sort of a scrappy startup of our own. Um, but our mission is to really to find practical solutions for small businesses and their investors so that they can kind of get back to work building those companies that are so critical to our communities, our economy, you know, across the board. Um, when I say small business, that scope is pretty wide. We include everything from like small mom and pop startups all the way through like larger unicorns all the way to small public companies. So a pretty broad um, swath of the marketplace. Um, we also have a particular focus, whether it's by mandated, but it's mandated by Congress. It's also kind of a personal passion of a number of us on the team, um, where we focus on identifying and addressing um, some of the unique challenges faced by diverse founders, women-owned businesses, um, as well as rural businesses and those affected by um, natural disaster and then investors in those companies. So that's the mission. Um, but what is it that we do actually? So first we um, 
we engage with a lot of groups across the country to hear their feedback on raising capital, um, to share our educational resources, and then to, to kind of identify where we can improve, where we can help to make uh, improvements to the, the framework in general. Um, so events a lot like this one. Um, so with the benefit of the feedback we get from folks like you, we um, monitor our rules and regulations. Uh, we wanna see if they're working or if there are areas that they can be improved. Um, also, as our rules change over time, and for those of you who, who follow along, they, they do tend to change a lot, um, we seek to make sure that the voices of small businesses and those investors are um, brought into that rulemaking process to, to have a seat at the table when the rules that are kind of governing this space are being uh, either you know, adopted or tweaked along the way. Um, we also recommend policy changes both to the commission and to Congress um, as part of our advocacy role. Um, you can find some of the recommendations, our most recent recommendations, for example, are um, they're always in our annual report. And as we get through some of the resources today, I'll show you where you can where you can find those. Um, so that's kind of who we are, the SEC broadly, John's office, my office. Um, but let's talk about why it might matter for you as you've got your entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneur hat on. So a lot of investors, I'm sorry, a lot of entrepreneurs um, that we meet tend to get to this point in the conversation. They start to scratch their heads. They're like, hey, you know, makes sense. John's office totally can help me out being an informed investor, um, you know, build and protect my savings. But I'm just a little startup. I'm just a private company. You know, why does the SEC care about me? More importantly, why should I care about the SEC? Um, well, I'll tell you. Um, and you may hear me say this one, more than once. I apologize in advance. But the SEC regulates the offer and sale of securities. So let's go on to see what that really means. Like, what is a security? Um, this slide has a few examples of, of securities that a startup might issue to its investors. Um, some of these might be familiar, um, but the main thing I want you to take away here is that a security is really broadly defined. So if you are unsure if what you're doing involves a security, please reach out for help. Um, and that reminds me of two points I wanted to make. One, um, we uh, are happy to make all these slides available. So please don't worry about frantically taking notes. Happy to share these with you. Um, and again, all the resources are online, so you can you can find them later. That was one point. The other point I wanted to make is um, to that point about, hey, if you're unsure or you have a question, reach out for help. Um, all of our resources are intended to provide like, background or context for our rules. We always recommend that you consult with counsel or just good solid advisors before actually moving forward with any kind of capital raise. We hope that these resources kind of help lay the groundwork, um, you know, for those conversations, um, maybe help you narrow the issues or identify the questions that you want to discuss. But then we hope you're going to discuss them with, with counsel or advisors. We don't want you to have to pay a lawyer to teach you the basics of securities and capital raising rules. Hopefully these can do that for you. But maybe once you've been through that, you can kind of narrow down and maybe that's some cost savings for you. I'll keep my fingers crossed. So turning back, um, gave some examples of securities. Um, but it also might help to understand what isn't a security. So uh, many early stage op entrepreneurs, I'm going to say that word a lot, so hopefully I don't stumble over it, um, are focused on seeking maybe free money like grants, or they're looking at loans and lines of credit. Those types of funding options likely don't involve securities. Um, and if this is where you are with your business, you still might be thinking about, hey, is this still relevant? Um, but one thing that we repeatedly hear from entrepreneurs who do go on to raise capital from investors is that they wish they knew more and they wish they knew it sooner. So even if raising capital, taking on investors seems like it might be far down the horizon, uh, hopefully what I share today will, will either help you down the road, you know, maybe if you decide to pursue it in the future. And you know, one of the things I'm hoping it does is it lets you kind of identify that line when you've crossed into the area where the SEC is paying attention. So just to put everything kind of in context there. Speaking of context, um, many businesses never actually seek capital from investors. In fact, of the businesses that looked to external sources of capital to fund their business, so they, they ran out of their personal savings and they had to go look elsewhere, only 6% of them are looking at um, equity financing or again, capital from investors. So 
it's a pretty small slice of the kind of overall funding pie. I, I noted earlier that a lot of them are starting out with, or maybe they're just sticking with grants, loans, things like that. Uh, so who are the companies that are turning to investors and what should they, what should they know? What should you be thinking about if you think you might go this route? So I keep talking about our resources. Um, a lot of those cover kind of what the options are to raise capital, but some of them also cover like, what are the things you should think about to make sure you're ready to even go down that pathway? This slide breaks it down. You'll see we have a cute little acronym capital, um, but it kind of breaks down some of the things that investors would expect a company to have in place prior to investing. Some of this may resonate a little bit with the things you'll learn uh, on, you know, from John's office about things you might want to ask about if you're looking to invest, particularly in, in smaller companies or private offerings. Um, but you'll see the little acronym. So C, capital, financial, ta uh, capital, capitalization tables and financial statements. You know, you want to have your books ready because your investors are going to want to see them. Um, A, the amount needed. How much do you need? P, the plan for proceeds. Investors are going to want to know how much you want, why you want that, and what you're going to do with it. Uh, what I get to, the I, investor strategy. Something to think about is that investors bring more than a check to the table, as many of you know. Um, and you want to know that you're you're going for the right investors. They're going to bring mentorship or connections or you know industry experience. So think about what that investor is really going to bring to you. Um, time and resources. Again, I may be preaching to the choir for some of you, but raising capital is like more than a full-time job on top of being a founder or an entrepreneur, also more than a full-time job. So just be prepared for the time and resources that you're going to kind of pour in just to the capital raising part of this process. Um, advisors, you heard me you, know, you heard me on that spiel already, but yeah, you're going to want to line up those attorneys, advisors, mentors, accountants um, that can really make sure you're, you know, again, it's a, they all kind of feed into each other. They, you know, we want your financial statements. You should have some good accountants, things like that. So just think about having that team around you ready to support you. Um, and then finally, the L's long-term vision. Uh, your investors, as John will attest, are going to want to know uh, kind of an exit strategy. They're going to want to know how long is their and, you know, how long are their funds invested in your business? What do you plan to do with them? Um, all of that. So um, again, you can find all of this in our stuff, but just a, a sense of the kinds of questions you may want to ask to get yourself ready to launch in. So for those that get through those questions, get those ducks in a row and are ready, um, where to next? So I'll walk through a couple of the potential pathways, um, but more than walk through those pathways, I'll share some tools to help founders figure out which one might be the right pathway for them. Um, so going back to something I said earlier, um, you know, the SEC regulates securities, all offers and sales of securities regulated by the SEC. So under our federal securities laws, all offers and sales of securities, even to just one person, must be either registered with the SEC, like an IPO, you know, public offering, or they need to be conducted under an exemption from registration. So um, you know, exempt offerings, sometimes called private offerings. There's a number of those. You'll see there, it's probably mouse print on the screen here, but I'll share this list here and elsewhere. So um, lots of options there. That, that, um, that basic rule, like registered or find an exemption, again, true for all companies, all sizes, private, public, reporting companies, non-reporting companies, even sales to friends and family. So, you know, even Uncle Mark wants to invest something in my company. That's an offer and sale of securities. You really got to make sure that if you're not going to register it, which you're probably not for one issuance to Uncle Mark, you're going to want to find your exemption. Um, I know I keep reiterating this, but I really want to put it on the radar as it sometimes you know comes as a surprise when it is that the SEC gets involved and when that oversight uh, and interest triggered. I talked about how I want... Uh, I want you all to leave kind of knowing when you start playing in the sandbox that the SEC cares about, and that's kind of where it is. So um, moving along, um, I mentioned, and you may hear talk all the time, of folks um, talking about their friends and family round or an angel round, maybe a series A. So the federal securities laws don't break it down that way. Um, instead, any company wishing to avoid having to register the offering, no matter who the investors are, it has to structure the deal to fit within an exemption. There's a bunch of them. 
Uh, and some of them have either been introduced or expanded or revised in the last 10 years. Um, so I'm not going to walk through all of them, but these slides include some common pathways. Um, and again, uh, the resources I'll share later kind of walk through them as well. Um, so again, don't get overwhelmed, just kind of rattling off some, some pathways. Um, but um, just to acknowledge that these, these are complicated, you know, the language isn't always intuitive. Um, so I'm going to focus more tonight on some of the tools we have to help you pick and choose among them. So um, a lot of our resources um, are uh, available to kind of, again, help you pick your pathway, help you compare, help you figure out, you know, which is a better alternative for my company, uh, including our interactive navigate your options tool that I'll share later. It's a little bit like a choose your own adventure. Um, but that tool and others of our uh, our resources are kind of based on some fundamental questions, some threshold questions to kind of break down the options available. Um, and so, you know, the questions are, are trying to identify like the fundamental elements of your of your capital raising plan. You know, like, what do you need? How much? Uh, how are you going to get it? And who and where are the investors that you're going to get it from? Um, again, may sound familiar, you know, pretty consistent with some of the earlier, um, the, the capital tool that I, I shared. Um, but taking those questions one at a time, one big differentiator among, um, among the pathways or the exemptions is the amount being raised. Some exemptions have offering caps. Um, for example, regulation crowdfunding, which some of you may be familiar with, that allows you to raise up to $5 million. So if you're going to want to raise more than that, probably can cross that one off your list. Um, in addition, we look at uh, data on usage and um, we can see that some types of offerings um, are, are more popular than others for companies looking to raise a certain amount. So looking at the types of offerings that companies use to raise those various amounts can help us uh, kind of figure out which ones are, are more practical options. So for example, there are no minimum offering amounts. No exemption says you can only use this exemption if you're going to raise more than a million dollars. It's just not how the exemptions work. But we've seen in our data that very few issuers rely on uh, Rule 506C, which is sort of a general solicitation crowdfunding, um, to raise less than a million dollars. It's just for whatever reason. It, it doesn't end up being a, a common solution in that space. Similarly, this is probably less surprising, very few companies go through an IPO if they're raising less than $75 million. So our Navigator tool, which again, I'll show you in a few minutes, takes that in, that kind of data into consideration so that it's, it's pointing to permitted pathways as well as um, kind of reasonably used uh, based on experience. Um, so, uh, you know, another factor to consider kind of moving through those questions I talked about is how are businesses going to connect with their investors? And this, I mean, it's why we're here tonight, right? Candace realized that networking is a challenge. And so she started, um, you know, started the the um, Workflow Wednesdays, that that idea of getting together and and networking and comparing notes and, and building that network, building that in that ecosystem. We hear that from so many people. Um, bridging gaps between entrepreneurs and potential investors remains the biggest challenge for, for early stage startups, kind of far and away. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons. It's important because it's a practical concern, right? Lots of entrepreneurs with great business ideas simply don't have that network of investors. And so, you know, you need to kind of figure out how you're going to build it or who's going to introduce you to them. Um, but it's also a regulatory concern because a number of the exempt pathways are going to limit how companies can find those investors. Um, they, you know, they might prohibit or limit, prohibit or limit, excuse me, the company's ability to generally solicit or advertise in order to market that offering. I can wake my mouse up. There we go. Um, so general solicitation, you know, what does that mean? Um, great question. Two ways to think of it. I think I do this a lot. First, there are examples of what is general solicitation, and you've got some here, um, you know, newspapers, unrestricted websites, radio, television. Um, 
and, and most kinds of seminars, uh, there's an exception there. Um, speaking of exceptions, the other way to think about it is what isn't general solicitation? Um, and you'll see there's, um, there are, here we go in the slides. Um, there are a couple of exceptions that uh, clarify when you are not generally soliciting. Um, primarily working with investors where the company or the founders have a pre-existing substantive relationship is not going to constitute general solicitation. Uh, and the slide here and then some of our resources will help you break down what does that mean? What does pre-existing mean? What is substantive? Um, but as a, as a general rule, um, you know, once you have that kind of a relationship with someone, you didn't get them through a general solicitation, then you're you're probably OK. Um, another of those kind of fundamental questions I asked before is who are your investors going to be um, and whether those investors are accredited. Um, many of you may be familiar with the idea of accredited investors, um, but uh, if not, or if you're not really sure what that means, a lot of the offering exemptions um, might limit participation to only accredited investors. Um, they may restrict the number of non-accredited investors or the amount that non-accredited investors can invest. Um, they may also add additional requirements or restrictions if the offering includes non-accredited investors. So as you can see, it's very important to understand if your investors are accredited or not, because it's going to dictate um, you know, what you have to do or what pathways might be available to you. Um, Accredited investors. So um, individuals can qualify as an accredited investor. It's either based on wealth or income thresholds or by meeting certain professional criteria. Again, uh, more details in the slide and more details in our in our resources. Um, and then entities can qualify as accredited investors. It's usually based on the amount of their investments or their assets or the type of company that they are. So, whew. Even without going into great detail, and uh, you know that actually wasn't a great amount of detail, I've clearly demonstrated the complexity of the of the framework of the capital raising framework and the rules you'd have to comply with. Um, but as I promised, not a closed book exam. So, like John's office, we have some tools for you. Um, and for that, I'm going to jump over to our website to show you kind of what we have and where we um, where you can find them. So, uh, I'll test my technology skills here. Uh, hopefully you are all now looking at my uh, my internet and looking at the Small Business Capital Raising Hub. John's giving me a thumbs up. Thank you. Um, I obviously had this bookmarked in preparation, but just to let you know where it is, if you go to sec.gov forward slash capital raising, you'll find it there. Or if you go to sec.gov and you forget about the rest of it, you can go to the blue ribbon under education and you'll find um, the Small Business Capital Raising Hub here. You'll also, a little hack tip to John, here is investor.gov under investor education, and here is their glossary as well. So um, all you have to really remember is sec.gov or to check our we check the slide deck and uh, everything later on. So on the hub, I'll just show you a few things. Um, we started the conversation a little bit, putting into context, what is raising capital from investors? Our funding roadmap kind of does the same thing. It tries to um, kind of show, look, you start off with self funds. You may look at some non-dilutive options like grants or loans, and then you may end up looking at um, investment or investors for, to, for capital. One thing I want to point out here is along the way, you'll find with all of our resources that we try to make everyone a gateway to learning more. So you can go as deep down the rabbit hole as you want with the resources on our page. So as you see, if you're looking through our resources, you'll see, oh, look, here's exploring some capital. Here's grants and loans. If you want to learn more, these are links that'll take you to additional resources. So that's our fundraising roadmap. Um, I uh, also mentioned our glossary, just like um, John did glossary key terms. We, too, have a, a glossary of terms. Uh, we call it our cutting through the jargon glossary. Um, we understand that capital raising lingo is, it can be, pretty opaque. Um, and so this is just an attempt to take some of those words that get thrown around a lot and make sure we're all talking about the same thing when we use them. And again, my earlier theme, this is also a way to drill down and uh, get more information. So 
um, you know, we talked about accredited investor. Here it is under A. <laughs> and then you'll see that um, if you want to learn more, you can link through to more and more resources here. So um, it may be, maybe you remember what the term means, but you think, oh, I think they had some more resources. Where can I find those? Try the glossary. That might be a good way for you to uh, for you to find it. Um, I talked about our navigating our navigate your options tool. That's right here as well. This one, it just asks you a series of questions. I'm going to answer them real quick because I do want to save time for um, questions. And I feel like I've been talking a lot. Um, but let's uh, we'll just presume that the business already exists um, and that you've already explored those those options, those grants, those loans, that line of credit. Um, Again, you'll see like the others, um, it, it asks about dilutive, non-dilutive capital. I don't remember what that means. Amy threw that word around, but you'll see that we have links and that links to our glossary that'll walk you through what it mean, what we talk about, or what we mean when we talk about dilution. So I'm gonna say, yeah, I explored everything. Um, do I know my pathway? Well, no, because that's why I'm here. Or maybe I do, maybe I'm pretty sure I wanna look at crowdfunding or I wanna do a private offering, but I still want to compare and make sure I haven't overlooked any other alternatives. So I'm going to say not yet. I'm going to say not yet. There we go. Um, and then, um, then we get back to those fundamental questions I talked about. How much do you want to raise? I'm just going to pick a million to five million. Um, how am I going to connect with my investors? Well, we talked about it's hard if you don't have a network. So let's see what pathways are there if I just don't know enough accredited investors. Um, so, uh, or I'm sorry, if I don't know them without um, advertising. So I'm going to say, I don't know yet. Maybe I have to generally solicit. Maybe I don't. Where are my investors located? Um, well, I'm in Northern Virginia, right outside of DC. I can barely grab lunch without crossing state lines. So I'm just going to say, I don't know. Um, getting back to the, the other question I was talking about, are my investors accredited? Uh, let's say no for argument's sake. And then it'll get you to the results page. Again, you can answer these questions however you want. The results page will, will respond to the input that you gave. And, and what we do is we just flag pathways that might be more relevant or might be less relevant. And again, this is based on the rule requirements as well as that data I talked about. Are people, you know, technically I could do an IPO for my million to five million, but the data shows that that's not really likely. So that's probably not relevant. So it's down below. And then each of these is a button that will take you to, again, to go as far down the rabbit hole as you want to more information. So let's say, oh, regulation crowdfunding. I thought that might be kind of interesting, but I don't really understand all the rules. So here's more information about that. Still not enough. You can go even further all the way down to, you know, the release when the rules were adopted. So really, um, trying to make these resources a way for you to find the information that you need in whatever level of detail you want um, want it to come in. Uh, I'm going to go back here. Um, I'm going to go back to our hub. You'll see we have a left nav there that gets you right back, or I could have gone to education. Um, the one other thing, again, there's a lot here, and you'll see it's organized by uh, kind of getting started, just kind of understanding the basics. Maybe that's like your 100 level. Um, you get down maybe a 200 level, like I know a little bit more, but I want to go into more detail. And then we also just have some uh, re just data research, things like that. So one other thing I wanted to flag, something called our building blocks. Um, and this is a key example of where we were engaged with groups like this. And someone said, this is really complicated. I wish you guys just had like one page or cheat sheets. Uh, I just want like a, a one page overview. We said, we can do that. So we took that feedback and we created this suite of essentially one pager. Sometimes we couldn't quite get it into a page, but again, you'll find there's our capital. So you're gonna find the same thing I showed before, um, different types of securities. What is the SEC? You'll see we covered a lot of this tonight. What are the pathways? What are credit investors? These are all probably sounding familiar now, um, but each of these, I'll just pick this one, are again, about a one pager goes into a little bit more information about some common questions, common topics that come up. This one is about like, what's the difference between you know, friends and family, angel investors and venture venture capital? That's a good question. Um, and it kind of walks you through what, what does a friends and family round mean? What, what level, you know, what stage are they coming in? What are they bringing to the table? How do they differ from angel investors? 
and then later on venture capital funds. So that might be of interest to folks who are trying to figure out who might my target investors be. So, um, and that's our backing up to our building blocks. And then there's um, back to our hub. I think the one other thing I promised to share with you um, is that our office every year puts out an annual report. We try to make that a um, kind of a snapshot of um, of um, and what's happening in capital raising across the marketplace. I've lost my um, my uh, tab here for a minute, so I will do this while talking. Um, but um, the uh, so it's we try to just kind of put in a, a snapshot of what's happening in the marketplace, all the way from um, early stage companies through smaller public companies. We also do a focus on women, minorities, rural, and natural disaster. Um, you can find that at our office webpage at sec.gov forward slash OASB. Uh, and then it's actually in the banner, but if the banner doesn't happen to be there at some point, you'll see it right here. Um, and there's our annual report. And then let me, oh, there it is from before. Um, okay, so you'll see our annual report here. Um, and this is where, you know, any of the data nuggets that you heard in my presentation, uh, are here um, information about you know what's working, what's not, where the challenges are, you know what you know are women getting VC dollars? What proportion of VC dollars are going to minority owned uh, minority owned businesses? So feel free to take a look at that um, at your leisure. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see our faces um, and so that I can see the chat. Uh, because there may be questions in there that I wasn't able to see. Let's see. Uh, okay, so I don't see anything in Q&A. John, feel free to jump in if you saw questions in the... No, I, I didn't see um, a question. I don't know if Rochelle has one based on the, the uh, you know, exposure that she has to the cohort participants. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll... I'll Stop talking and see if you've got one, Rochelle. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I I actually have a question. I always learn something from Amy. But Rochelle, did you have anything? You go ahead, John. I'm always full with questions as well. Uh, <laughs> definitely just knowing, uh, first and foremost, what an incredible work through of information that you guys have just put on. This is incredible. Um, I, I kid you not, you're, you're spot on, John. So many examples, experiences that we've seen uh, across the board with our entrepreneurs that uh, get lost in the sauce with, with this information. So this was so plainly put and can't thank you guys enough. John, you go ahead with your question. I was just yeah. going to say, hey, if the, you know, Q&A is officially on board. If people had questions, feel free to drop them in. Uh, but yeah, go ahead with yours first, John. Yeah, so um, first of all, I, I noticed your your map, which you know I, I really like, Amy, uh, where you show different uh, you know capital raising, raising trends in different regions. And so since Lightship, if I understand it correctly, first of all, you have a lot of, you're, you're in Detroit today, right, Michelle? But you've got a lot of Midwest connections, but have been expanding. And certainly your ecosystem, your network has been expanding nationwide. So I wanted to highlight for folks to go to that page that, that Amy just scrolled by that had regional data on capital raising. You mentioned Amy that um, that you when you're raising capital, uh, you know, in the you know through the 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 frameworks that matter for the SEC in any case, which I feel like is is definitely at least of interest to Lightship members, right? They most of the Lightship members have probably gotten through those initial stages and are part of the six percent, or feel like they're likely to be part of the six percent that's looking to raise uh, raise outside capital in this you know in these ways. Uh, so you said either you are registered with the SEC or you have an exemption that makes sense for what you're doing. So it's like very foundational, important information that you probably can't repeat enough. Yeah. Certainly the uh, any professional investors, VCs, et cetera, that, that the entrepreneurs at Lightship are deal might be dealing with deeply understand that. Are there other things like that? Maybe the second order thing that a VC is very obvious to a VC but might not be nearly as obvious to the entrepreneur that you come across, right? And so just thinking through this lens of the VC does this all of the time and the entrepreneur does it once. Yeah. Um, what are the other things that um, that they might, that, that might be surprising or important to know for the entrepreneur? Um, so I think um, 
one of the things, and I touched on it briefly, but again, you can never repeat it enough, is um, really understanding that what the investor is bringing to the table. Sure, every investor is bringing a check of some sort, right? Um, but I don't know if I can say what's more important than the check, but really what's more important to the, than the check sometimes is what else are they bringing? So, um, you know, a VC is going to bring experience. It's going to be it bring experience, taking a company through a VC round and then taking it through, um, you know, whatever that future might be, likely exit outcome, you know, hockey stick growth, uh, whether that's a sale or a merger or an IPO. Um, but the entrepreneur um, needs to understand that, like, if you're looking at a VC, then that VC is going to come in with experience and expertise, and you should appreciate that and want that. Um, one thing to think about is, you know, for folks who have maybe done those early rounds and are thinking, okay, the next step is VC, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. Um, you know, not all companies, well, not all companies are meant to take on investors. <laughs> not all companies are meant to go the VC route. Not all companies are meant to go public. You really have to understand that pathway and what it means to you. And like, and whether that's the right, um, whether your business model is the right fit for that. You can have a business model that, uh, you know, maybe you've done an early round. Uh, maybe you've got some angels on there. Um, you know, maybe you've, um, even got some really experienced investors in there that are there and supporting you and giving you advice and helping you build your management team. Um, it's not a failure to say, this is the right place for my business to be. I'm not ready or VC isn't for me. So I think this is just a question you need to keep asking yourself every new round, every new set of investors. Um, you need to make sure that that is the right fit. The same way the investor needs to make sure their investment in you is right, you know, your kind of buy-in to the investor needs to be right as well. Um, so, you know, I think that's, and there's, you know, there are other considerations that we talked about, um, you know, all those uh, you know, early stage, just getting ready for your first investor, but then again, making sure your long-term vision is right for, for your later stage investors that you're, um, you know, when you're doing the next round, how much do you need for the next round? It's just as important a question for your series C as it is for your pre-seed round, right? So you just have to remember to keep asking those questions and to um, and to be honest with yourself and your business. Like, is this the right next step for me? So those would be a couple of things I might suggest folks think about. Man, Amy, that's spot on. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, uh, you know, it, the, the words that you put in terms of finding the right fit, that is something that we preach. <laughs> a ton. So I, I mean, couldn't echo that even more. Uh, and quite frankly, one of the key things that we definitely teach uh, in a lot of our educational programming to founders, yeah. uh, that is just as important. So I mean, cr critical information here. Um, I had one uh, other additional question uh, that uh, kind of, I would say, given the landscape of all the nuanced tools that have come out, there's so many um, you know, net new tools for founders that help them in terms of, you know, fundraising, or maybe they use, you know, something like AngelList or some of these other kind of, you know, reticent tools that, you know, may not have been as accessible in the past, but probably in the last, I don't know, you guys know more than me, right? Last three to four years, so many companies that have come uh, out net new that either equipped founders within their fundraise, making it easier, or better yet, trying to just enable more access, more visibility to their raises. Um, you went quite in depth today on kind of like the solicitation piece and how to kind of like stress test to see what's what's available, what's not. Uh, you know, can you touch on that a bit or more specifically, is there like a, a, a vetted list, people that you guys prefer, recommend, or just in general, how can how can founders navigate and make sure that they're using tools that won't set them up for failure, or that'll set them up for success, really, in that category? Yeah, that is a great question. And and to the sort of, is there an investor database out there? Um, no, there is not. We get that a lot. And a lot of people wish there were, but we can't, just like we can't endorse a company, we can't endorse an investor. Um, sure. But two things I would flag. And again, I'll, everything we say is always like, these are the questions you need to ask. These are the issues you need to explore. So um, one thing is, um, you know, pay attention to that general solicitation because it can really be a footfall when you, you know, you're thinking you're just chatting on TikTok or Facebook or whatever, Instagram. Um, 
and all of a sudden that's an unrestricted website right so um I'm not drawing a legal conclusion I'm just flagging for the for the group that you just you just want to be careful that when you are talking about your um your offering and if you're using a pathway and you know reg d the kind of private offering the classic you know for folks who have already raised those early rounds those are familiar terms you know that you can't um generally solicit if that's the path you're going to go so you just want to be careful um the you know focus on that pre-existing substantive relationship whether it's yours or through a broker dealer I'm going to come back to the broker dealer part in a minute. Um, there are things called demo days. There are some restrictions on what is a demo day, but a lot of the, you know, if it's a um, educational institution or a nonprofit that's hosting it and access is limited to the group, these are all going to sound familiar because you've all done those kinds of things, I'm sure. Um, you know, a lot of those pitch competitions are in fact demo days, but you do want to be careful that those pitch competitions are actually demo days. And if you don't know, maybe ask the organization, <laughs> you know, like get, get feedback. They'll know what they're supposed to do if it's supposed to fall into the demo day um, uh, exception. Uh, and again, if you don't know what a demo day is or what those exception requirements are, uh, I'm pretty sure it's in our glossary, pretty sure we have it in our general solicitation tool. You can always go back and look it up. Um, one other thing I was going to say, and I, you know, we're probably running up against time and I can't give a whole primary on or primer on uh, broker dealers, but um, one of the challenges with networking is like meeting new people and who can introduce you when and if you've got an offering going on, can can you pay somebody to introduce you to all their friends? The short answer is no-ish. Um, like you, you want to be really careful when you've got somebody introducing you to their friends and their friends and their friends if there's any kind of compensation involved, any kind of transaction-based compensation. I just stated that in really, really broad strokes. We have a few... Uh, resources on our page about what is a broker dealer. But if you take away nothing else, remember to ask the question if you're working with somebody to find investors, make sure they're not operating as an, you know, an unregistered broker dealer, because not only is that a problem for them, it's a problem for the founder. So you can't, you don't get to go back later and say, oh, well, I didn't know that they were you know, an unregistered broker dealer. Unfortunately, our colleagues in enforcement are not really going to care because that's not an exception, <laughs> an exception to the rule. So just keep in mind that some of those um, activities that your network might be performing for you could trip into a regulated area, particularly if there's any compensation involved. So those are kind of the magic things to think about. Incredible. And super important. I, I'm glad that you were uh, able to <laughs> break that down and, and, uh, Again, these are these are you know common things that we see just across the board with so many founders that we come across every day. So uh, I can't thank both of you enough for for today's uh, session. It's super informative, uh, and more importantly, to everyone who's listening and tuning in, thank you guys as well uh, for joining us today. Um, I, it, as you can see in the chat, we do have some of the links that uh, Amy had hinted to and that John had hinted to, but we will be sure to send. Uh, you know, follow up notes with these links as well as with the presentation uh, so that everyone can access and use these incredible tools uh, that Amy and John's team have put together for you guys. So um, yes, uh, as we close up and wrap up guys, uh, you had it in your deck, but just one more time, let folks know where they can find you, where they can uh, get, you know, of course, info and beyond that, you know, if they have further, you know, exploration that they want, where can they go? Well, I'll, I'll start um, absolutely find the hub at sec.gov forward slash capital raising, reach out to me or anyone on our team at smallbusiness at sec.gov. Um, and I promise we're a small team. We will get back to you. If it's a question or even if it's like, I looked at your stuff and I have some feedback on it. We love feedback. That's how half our resources get started. So. <laughs> and for uh, the investor education side for your, let's call it your personal finances as opposed to the business investor.gov. Uh, so all the resources that we talked about are investor.gov and you can connect with us with, for presentations and connecting with your network. If you have a community organization or school or something like that at outreach at sec.gov, outreach at sec.gov. And if you have a question about your investing work, again, outside of your business, uh, help at sec.gov. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks a ton guys yet again. 
Uh, thanks again to everyone who's tuned in tonight for tonight's rendition of Virtual Workflow Wednesday. Uh, we hope you have garnered and gained much more information uh, than before you started. And uh, again, we, we echo our gratitude to both John and Amy for the time tonight and for your time and expertise with our entrepreneurs. Um, all right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening and look forward to seeing you guys on the next time we get together for Workflow Wednesday. Thanks a ton, everyone. Thank you.